So welcome back. Uh, a long hiatus. Hello, good evening, yeah. Rabbi. Good evening, good evening, all. And uh, yeah, good, good, good to be back. And hopefully, we're going to uh, continue doing this on a on a regular basis now, uh, without interruptions. Um, I want to touch on a classic story. A classic story that is given to us as the reason for the exile, the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem. It's, it's a story brought down in the Talmud, Gitin, page 54b, and it's a famous story of uh, referred to as Kamtze or Bar Kamtze. And what I'd like to do is, is do a bit of an analysis on, on this uh, story, uh, which is strange, strange. You know, it reads very nicely, and then we start analyzing, um, and, and we go a little bit deeper. So this is what the Talmud tells us. Um, the Gemara tells us that uh, Jerusalem was destroyed because of Kamtza and Bar Kamtza. So who are these people, Kamtza and Bar Kamtza? Um, so there's a man in Jerusalem, and he's got a very good friend called Kamtza and an enemy called Bar Kamtza. And he uh, makes a feast and he sends his servant to go and invite guests. And one of the guests that he asks him to invite is his good friend, Kamtza. But unfortunately, uh, the servant goes and brings Bar Kamtza, who's not exactly his friend. And this uh, causes quite a bit of awkwardness. Um, so the host comes into his party, imagine this uh, wedding, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, whatever it is, and finds Bar Kamtze comfortably sitting at the feast. What was Bar Kamtze thinking? Uh, well, you know, he wants me there. Um, I'm going to you know, accept the invitation. And the host says to Bar Kamtze, what, what are you doing here? In, in Tamburic parlance, one often talks in the third person, uh, even about uh, himself. So you're that man's enemy, meaning my enemy. Um, what are you doing here? Please leave. Uh, now, it's, it seems extremely important to Bar Kamtze uh, to, 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 to uh, remain. Um, and he says, look, don't do this to me since I'm already here. Let me stay. And I will give you money for whatever I eat and drink. Just don't embarrass me by sending me out. Please let me stay. Um, but it, it doesn't help. And by come to will successively uh, offer greater sums of money. You know, I, I will pay for, for half of the feast. I mean, we, we normally assume that, uh, you know, this was a wealthy man of Jerusalem, but he obviously wasn't so wealthy. If I come to try to bribe him with, you know, I'm going to pay for, for half the feast. Don't send me away. Don't embarrass me. Eventually, but Kamtza says to him, no, no, I'm going to pay for the entire feast. I'm going to go down to even, you know, the, 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 the flowers and the chair covers. I'm going to pay for every single thing as long as you let me stay here and, and, and don't put me through um, this situation of me having to leave. And eventually the host said to him, look, there's no way you can remain here. You've got to go and text by Kamtza and kind of, you know, um, physically escorts him out. Now, here's a twist to the story. Barkhamts are obviously angry, um, and he says to himself, since the sages were sitting here and did not protest the actions of the host, even though they saw what I was going through, um, clearly they're happy. The rabbis are here, they're sitting at the feast, they were also guests, and they watched my humiliation, no objection, nobody protested, therefore, they agree. And his decision is to go and inform the king, that's the uh, Roman emperor, um, and he goes and says to the emperor, Jews are rebelling against you, um, and he's you know, fomenting real, real trouble uh, by suggesting that um, the Jews are living, they were living at that time under Roman rule, um, maybe not happily, but uh, contentedly, and things were working. And the temple was functioning, and you know, offerings were being brought, and and uh, you know, there were yeshivot, and, and we just you know, we didn't have at that point 
um, political autonomy, the, the Romans were in charge, but as long as we were playing the, the game, then things were well. But now he says, the Jews are rebelling against you. And the emperor says, well, kind of prove it to me. And Barkhamsa says, if you, if you bring an offering in honor of the government um, and they don't sacrifice it, well, there's your proof. Um, and uh, that's precisely what happened, <coughs> except for the Barkhamsa's uh, intervention in creating a blemish um, in the uh, calves of the lip. Uh, and the problem is that we may not offer any gifts in the temple that are not physically perfect. So an animal that has a blemish and the blemish or cut in the upper lip that would be considered a blemish, you wouldn't be able to bring it as a sacrifice. Um, and uh, other say it was um, eyelids, wherever it is. The point is he, he very cleverly blemished the animal halachically without really causing any major defect uh, so that the, the Romans would never understand our refusal to bring the uh, calf um, while, you know, according to the rules, you know, it's not, it's not uh, acceptable. And I'm, I'm skipping a bit here. Um, but a few lines further, the Talmud says, well, that's when the conquest of Jerusalem took place and eventually um, its, its destruction. Now, that's the story. And the suggestion is that the, the Talmud says that that's the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem. It has to do with a Kamtza and um, a Bar, bar Kamtza. Um, but if we go back and, and look at the story, very little of it makes sense. So I'd like to go back uh, and I'd like to look at it, not exactly section by section, but, but, but look at some of the, some of the um, rather difficult, complicated, inexplicable uh, sections. And maybe we can put um, some, some order uh, into all of this. So let's go back into the text. And of course, we're gonna go back right to the beginning. Uh, and look at what's going on over here. So, um, yeah, the man whose friend is Kamtsa and Bar Kamtsa, and the enemy is Bar Kamtsa, um, the huge feast, and the servant brings the wrong guest. Well, that makes a lot of sense, you know, when you have a, a best friend who's called Kamtsa and uh, an enemy called uh, Bar Kamtsa, well, that makes a lot of sense. But there, it doesn't make doesn't make sense anymore. All right, so the host comes and finds his enemy. Uh, and his enemy is begging him to be allowed to remain at the feast. Uh, he wants to save face. He wants to be seen. That's a place to be. Um, why um, does the host insist on evicting him, particularly as clearly he wasn't a, a very wealthy man? Uh, otherwise, you know, why would he be uh, offering him to bribe him by, by paying for his own meal or, or the entire feast? And, and, and he's saying no. Um, so clearly, you know, he could use the help. And, and, and why doesn't he want to leave uh, that man there? And, and, and then um, what about Barkant's, uh, you know, exclamation, the rabbis are sitting here. They don't protest it, but let's stop for a moment. Why didn't the rabbis in any way protest the actions of this host? I mean, why were there no attempt to say, come on, let the man stay, uh, save his dignity? Um, you know, that behavior makes the least sense in the entire story. But judging by Bar Kamtz's reaction, we get a bit of an inkling. And I'm, I'm, I'm dipping here into the commentary on the Talmud by the Khatam Sofer. And he says, look the way he reacts and you understand who he was. I mean, the fact that his reaction, as pained as it was, is to go inform the Roman authorities gives us a bit of an inkling into the kind of person um, that, that he is. And the Khatam Sofi uses the words Russia. He was a wicked man. He was an evil man. Uh, not just because of, of his reaction, but his reaction and his, uh, is, is an indication of, of where he was at to start with and in the first place. It appears that he was a Roman sympathizer all along. And uh, by cancer, 
um, you know, and they were unfortunately at the, in the, at that time, uh, and, and a further study of, of that section of the Talmud there in Gitan, page 55 onwards, uh, it, it makes it very clear that there were people who had different ways of, 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 of dealing with the Roman occupation, and there were those who were very sympathetic to the Romans and, uh, and, and thought that one had to handle them completely differently, and others who thought there should be an uprising, and, and in fact that caused a civil war within Jerusalem uh, during the occupation. Um, clearly, Bar Kamta is a man who is not on the side of, of the rabbis, of the Jews, I mean, uh, possibly he was a, a, a Sadducee. Uh, they were quite powerful, uh, and uh, they did not respect rabbinic authority. Um, but he was definitely not um, a, a, uh, the kind of person that the host of this party wanted to have at his dinner. Not because of, uh, uh, he was using the most expensive caterer in town and it was gonna cost him you know, a large amount to accommodate him at his feast. Not for that reason. Simply because this man stood for the antithesis, antithesis of what you know, the Jewish community in Jerusalem at the time uh, stood for. He, he was, he was uh, not just a rebel, uh, but in fact one that uh, was a persona non grata in the Jewish community, which then explains why it's so important for him to be allowed to remain um, while the host wants him out of there because he doesn't want uh, his own reputation tainted in any way by hosting a fellow of, of, of that ilk. Um, Bar Kamtze feels that if he's being allowed to stay there, uh, that's going to kind of rehabilitate him and that's going to uh, uh, make him accepted in the community. And of course, he has huge political gain from remaining at that party where it, it seems like the Hoi Poloi uh, of Jerusalem is there and definitely uh, you know, a number of the, of the rabbinate uh, are present. Uh, and that suits him very well in terms of his own personal image. Uh, so there's a bit of a political uh, tug of war going on here, um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, for 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 the host, this is this is absolutely out of the question. This is the the hugest embarrassment that a person of that nature, with that type of convictions, uh, is actually going to uh, be present at his party, where he's invited his friends, where he's invited uh, his rabbis. Um, he won't have any of it. So he's going to insist, even though the financial allure of having this entire party covered is, is, is significant, he's going to insist on Bakamta having to, sorry, on Bakamta having to vacate and, and, and leave the premises. And the rabbis are sitting and they're watching this with great interest because they had their own personal dilemma. After having been seated at the party for a few moments, they notice that a man in whose company they don't want to be is actually there. And the house is going to look upon them, that they were present at a party where a man of the political and religious convictions of Bar Kamsa is sitting and being wined and dined by the host. And so they're kind of sitting at the edge of their seat and watching this with great interest, because if he's being allowed to stay, they're going to have to um, leave themselves. But they don't want to be seen. You know, in, in a social environment where this individual is there. So they've got a, a great dilemma, and you can imagine the tension in the air uh, as the host prevails upon by cancer that he's got to leave. Um, and the rabbis, rather than raise an objection, in fact, kind of kind of hold their hands back from clapping with glee, uh, because this is clearly the outcome that they were hoping for. Um, they did not want uh, it to be reported in the whatever the Jerusalem Post or whatever, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, news outlet the following morning that they were there and that they joined in, in, in an event together with this individual. So that kind of puts a bit of a spin in perspective and it also explains um, what, is, what is perhaps a disproportionate reaction of back cancer uh, to, uh, you know, to, to this eviction. Uh, it's not just that he was embarrassed and the rabbis were there and they didn't object. It's actually, you know, where his loyalties are. Uh, he actually would like to see Jerusalem destroyed. He'd actually like the Romans to, to, to take down uh, the temple. Um, and, and, and now he's found um, a way to go about this. And very publicly, he shouts out, you know, if the rabbis were here and they didn't object to my humiliation, and I'm, 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 I'm going to get you all. Um, but that, that uh, 
is, is not just a reaction to an isolated event, but the headspace in which, and the political uh, mindset in which this individual is. Well, it explains almost everything about the story, except for the opening statement that says, because of Kamtsa and, and, and Bar Kamtsa, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. Um, anyway, what about Kamtsa? You know, what was he? Uh, why, 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 why is he being blamed? He wasn't even there. So how could the Talmud say because of cancer? But, but, uh, uh, just to digress for a moment, I read a beautiful, you know, interpretation that if if he was really this host's best friend, um, he should have come anyway. Um, you know, he should have thought that the invitation got lost to the post, or he had the wrong email address. Uh, and you know, it's a, it's a it's a lesson to all of us that uh, you know sometimes uh, uh, we start uh, standing on ceremony, and I wasn't invited properly, or I wasn't invited at all, or you know, he should have uh, uh, come uh, picked up the phone, and I just sent a, a group broadcast, and I'm, I'm not attending the event. Uh, so Kamsa's behavior is not 100 uh, uh, percent above board either. Uh, because if he was really this host's kind of really, really good friend, he should have been there. But that's just a, an aside. Um, it's, it, 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 you know, I think the Talmud means to say that because of the confusion between cancer and bar cancer and their similar names, uh, this happened. There's even a suggestion that that cancer is bar cancer's father, because bar in Aramaic, of course, means son of. Uh, so possibly bar cancer may have been his son, but that's that's neither here nor there um, at the moment. The point is this, if the host was completely correct in not allowing a Rasha, a person of Bar Kamsa's ilk, uh, to be seen at his event, and if the rabbis were correct in not objecting because really he didn't belong there, um, then why is this cited as a cause for the destruction of Jerusalem? Um, it's not just that the Talmud is telling us about which event led to it. Talmud kind of seems to, to um, make it a causative event, not just uh, you know, that it happened one after the other. This, you know, that, that's how it came about. Um, it, it's deeper than that. And if the Gemara tells us that it was an account of cancer by cancer that Jerusalem was destroyed, there's got to be some kind of a link. The answer is that th th this situation was highly symbolic of the state of the Jewish people at the time. Um, that is, exile was beginning. What is exile? What is exile? Um, and the destruction of the temple is a result of exile. It's not that exile happened because exile is a state of being. What we call galut is a situation of disconnect, where there is a, a disconnect between Hashem and his world and Hashem and, and, and the Jewish people. What was the status pre-exile? Pre-exile we had a Beit HaMikdash, a holy temple. And what was that? It was the presence of God, was the home of God in, in this world. And Pierre Kavra tells us that 10 miracles happened in the Betamic Dash at all times. What was the, the, the importance of those miracles? It was so that people could come there and actually see Hashem, see manifestations of God. Because in, in the world that we know, um, God is very conspicuously absent. He has succeeded in hiding himself extremely well. But in a world that is not in exile, in a world as it existed in the Holy Temple days, there was a presence of Hashem that could be ostensibly, tangibly viewed and felt, and not just by Jews who, who were there all the time, but by anybody who came in and was able to witness those miracles, uh, we prove it to them, and, and experience that, and, and, and therefore experience God. That is when Hashem is in connect with the world. Um, during the days of the temple, 
there was a resonance between Hashem, the Jewish people, and the world. So the world was an open place for Hashem. Hashem was at home in the world. But of course, that's very much linked with the task that we have in this world as Jewish people, uh, which is to uh, make this world into God's home. That is, in fact, the, the very purpose uh, and all be all of the creation of the world. God wants this home to be uh, this, sorry, world, excuse me. God wants this world to be a home for him. And, and Hashem, um, when it's all working, that's uh, the opposite of exile, or what you call stage of gula, of, 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 of redemption. And uh, that's in that redemptive state, it all works. God's connected with the world, God's connected with the Jewish people, and it all works very, very well. But when you get into exile, galut, it's a situation of dissonance, the situation of disconnect, where Hashem is disconnected from the world, and Hashem is, in a sense, disconnected from, from the Jewish people. And I'll come back to that in a moment. doesn't mean he's removed himself completely, but he's kind of obscured himself um, to the extent that, as I said earlier, he's, he's, he's playing hide and seek, uh, but he's hidden. And, uh, and, and sometimes we forget that we've got to go and seek. Uh, but the idea is precisely that our role is the seeking and, and the uncovering uh, and the saying, I see you, um, please uncover uh, yourself. Um, how does that resonance happen? So it all works together, but the, kind of there's three ways. Hashem, it's, it's the world, it's his presence in the world, and there's our role in it. Our role is to keep God in the world. And when there is division, divisiveness in the Jewish community itself, that creates an inability for that resonance to take place. Because God is a wholeness and oneness. Because if you had to, to look for one word to describe Hashem, it's, it's the word one. Uh, Hashem is Yachid and Echad, is one and only. Um, and, and Hashem is ultimate oneness and unity. And that works very well when we're united. Because you can, you can take something from, from Hashem, the one and only, and you can, in, a, in essence, take uh, divine powers and allow them to rest into the world through the Jewish people that are the vessel, okay? Um, if there is this unity among the Jewish people, um, then that's like trying to pour water in a broken vessel. It doesn't get contained. So Hashem cannot in any way, not that he doesn't want, but he's, he doesn't work for divine emanations, for divine blessing to rest upon a broken vessel as in a Jewish nation that is not in harmony, that is in, 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 in division, is just something that doesn't work very well. Um, and, and as a result, um, the blessing doesn't rest. So um, we have the concept that Hashem blesses us in unity. We say it in the Amida, um, three times a day. Barcheinu avinu kulanu kechad. It's in that last bracha of the Amida. Bless us, Hashem, all as one. Uh, it's not we're just asking Hashem to, 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 to bless everybody. Uh, we're saying, Hashem, bless us when we are oneness, when we are unity, when there's togetherness, we're able to receive this blessing. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's like putting the, the square, proverbial square peg into the round hole, or maybe the proverb is the round uh, peg into the square or other way, it doesn't fit. Um, so, so Hashem um, is not able to resonate with his people. And that creates that situation of exile. And of course, we are the, the, the worst victims of exile um, because it's as if Hashem is kind of hiding his face from us um, and we no longer see uh, the, the, the divine blessings resting upon us because they cannot because of the lack of unity. And uh, as a result of that, of course, there is galut in the world where the presence of Hashem in the world as a, as a whole um, cannot be 
uh, felt and um, experienced. So what brought about what? It, it kind of all works together. Um, is the lack of unity among the people um, just a manifestation of Galut, or is it the other way around? Uh, well, clearly the Talmud seems to indicate that it's a state of being where the Jews were not united. And think about this. I mean, a simcha is a time of ultimate breaking down of barriers. That's what joy does to you. Um, so let me tell you um, about funerals versus weddings from, from the rabbi's perspective, perhaps. Uh, funerals, uh, the rabbi sadly walks behind the coffin that is being taken for burial and, and behind are the immediate mourners in the family and sometimes you kind of can't help but eavesdrop on conversations and they go like this is such and such here so these two could have done is come to the funeral you know um after everything that dad did for him he couldn't take an hour out of an hour out of his time and come to uh you know, to 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 uh, to West Park and pay his last respects, um, and, and so it goes. What kind of state of being are people when they are accompanying a loved one? It's not simcha. It's not happiness. Um, sadness <laughs> squeezes you, and you become narrow in your outlook, and so you become petty in your outlook. That's what sadness does to you. Uh, but enough about funerals. What does a simcha do? A simcha puts you in a state of happiness, and that widens you, opens your heart. Um, theoretically, at a simcha, you are on the dance floor, and Bar Kamsa walks in the front door, you arch enemy, you embrace him, you slap him onto a dance floor, and say, thanks for coming. Um, because there is no room for pettiness, there's no room for, for being closed, there's no room for exclusion. All boundaries break down when you're in a level of Simcha. And, and this is what is so tragic about the eviction of Bar Kamte from the unnamed hosts event. Yes, yeah. on, on paper, uh, I wrote it all down earlier, all the boxes are ticked. It makes sense uh, that, you know, he was a Russia and it was wrong for Bar Kamte to have him, to, for the host to have him there, and it wouldn't look right, and the rabbis would be compromised by his presence. And so on paper, rationally, it, all the boxes tick. But in practice, that's just not the way it should have happened. In practice, um, it's a simcha. And we should have overlooked all of this. And there should have been complete unity. And nobody should have been petty about it. And people should have overlooked the differences. The fact that such a tragedy could happen was symbolic of the level um, of, let me use the word dysfunction. Uh, in, in the community, uh, where there was not that love, where there was, um, you know, uh, there was that kind of, of, of lack of tolerance uh, that resulted in the tragedy. And of course, that uh, was the very state of being, not necessarily the trigger event, but the state of being that caused uh, this divine dissonance, inability to resonate with us, uh, to bless us, um, very sadly, a state of um, galut, so it's a classic story that uh, comes up during these uh, three weeks of mourning, nine days of mourning leading up to Tisha B'Av, uh, because we concentrate on that. And, and we, 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 we're mindful of the fact that, as the sages say, a generation in which the temple isn't rebuilt is a generation in which the temple was technically destroyed. Um, we want to rebuild the temple. Um, and that means that we want to, uh, through random acts of love for people who are not necessarily deserving of our love, um, undo uh, the damage that's done to the fabric of a society and rebuild the United Jewish people so that God's blessing can rest on us, so you can resonate with us and resonate within the world. Uh, thank you very much and have a um, good evening.